From Our Savior's Atonement Lutheran Church on Bennett Avenue in the heights of New York City, welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air, where we shine a light on the musicians, filmmakers, writers, and artists of all stripes who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. I'm Aaron Sims. I'm Jonathan Bell. And I'm Gordon Ostrowski. And yes, listeners, this is an opera edition of Live and Local. Gordon joins us today as our resident opera expert. Before working with us, he spent 25 years as assistant dean and stage director at the Manhattan School of Music. Lovely to have you here, Gordon. Jonathan, who joins us today? Aaron, today, Live and Local welcomes mezzo-soprano Laura Varela. As a child growing up in her native San Juan, Laura saw Carmen and announced immediately that is what she wanted to do with her life. <laughs> she began singing with the Coros de Niños de San Juan, the San Juan Children's Choir, and went on to study at the John Hopkins Peabody Conservatory and the Manhattan School of Music. She has since earned an international reputation for her nuanced portrayals of complex, strong, independent women Frida Kahlo and Carmen among them. One critic described her portrayal of Carmen as, quote, sensual, uninhibited, and liberated, a Carmen for our times, end quote. Opera is just one of Laura's passions, though. Her heart is never far from her native Puerto Rico, and she uses her voice to champion the underperformed Puerto Rican classical repertoire and through the Puerto Rican Art Song Project to promote Puerto Rico's underappreciated novelists, poets, and essayists. I'm so pleased she's with us today on Live and Local. Without further ado, Laura Varela. Oh, 
singing for you is from Handel's Rodelinda. The character of Edwige is a scorned woman, and she is going to turn her love into fury to make an example of the man that's wronged her. from the opera Mignon by Thomas. Um, the character Mignon sings Connecti le pays. She has been abducted from Italy and taken north by a band of gypsies. Um, and she has very vague memories of her, 
uh, homeland. And at one point where she is being rescued by a young gentleman, she asks him, she wants to go back home, do you know, do you know where this land is? And she describes the beauty of the eternal spring in Italy.
Laura, thank you so much for singing the uh, Delilah. I'm going to use the English version. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and when I read the translation in preparing for today, I noticed that she reminded me a lot of another character, mainly Carmen. Do you see any similarities between the two characters? You no, know, I definitely do. I think that these two women are women that have often been vilified in the opera um, community. We think that they are man-eaters of such. But I see them as very complex women who fell in love with the wrong person at the wrong time, and they're having to come to terms with those choices that they made as women. Um, this specific uh, aria, it's often referred to as the vengeance aria. But I find it very interesting that she feels like she may fail in the task at hand, which has been asked of her. It's not necessarily what she wants to do, but what she must do for her people. And rather than requesting that the god of war or the god of seduction or lust help her, she goes and she begs of love personified to come to her aid. And uh, yeah, I think that that says a lot about the type of person that she is and the profoundness of her feelings. Mm -hmm. Yes, and she's very confident in her sexuality and her ability to use it to an end. Indeed, indeed. It's just women that are not afraid to state their mind, their opinion, and to um, acknowledge their beauty and the power that may come with it. Um, but there's nothing villainous about that. It's just empowering. Thank you. Um, Handel is always a challenge for young singers, I find, because you have to bring so much of yourself to the character. Um, and, um, of course, you had the um, normal structure of a Baroque aria, the A section, the B section, and then you go back to the A section. And it's always traditional for the artist to ornament that uh, repeat of the A section. But how, how does the singer approach that? Because to me, it's like mind boggling because there's so many choices you could make, but how do you really accomplish that goal? I guess when I first, it, it comes very natural to me to hear a melody and then imagine what else it could be within the harmonic context that the composer has given you. Um, for this specific aria, and very often in Handel, you know, you only get one sentence of text from the very beginning. It's like simple subject predicate, and then you just repeat and repeat and repeat. And I think, uh, for me, everything that you choose to do with it, even the first time around, before you change the melody, and then the second time around, when you decide to even enhance more, it has to do with feeling where, how is Handel feeling these words differently, and how is that reflected in the way that he said it in this particular instance? Sometimes he will say, you know, the same text will be in something that is very fast uh, with a lot of moving notes, but sometimes he will go on a just one held note for a very long time. Sometimes he'll take you up, sometimes he'll take you down. And every single one of those choices that he made is a different interpretation of the same sentence. So you go through the whole gamut of feelings and emotions. And uh, I mean, definitely that is what happens to a woman or a man who is scorned, right? If you... Uh, your heart is broken and then you are enraged and then you are depressed and then you beg and then you're in denial and then, so you go through all of this and I think that um, that is the thing that uh, a singer has to try to latch on to when you first run through what Handel has written and then the second time around it just gives you the liberty to take it farther like how do you feel this emotion do you feel like screaming do you feel like whispering to him very quietly what you want to say and, uh, and then you just take that harmonic uh, skeleton that he gives you and you play. It, it, you know, it lets you be completely free and creative with it. And there's just nothing more satisfying as an artist. Thank mm. you very much. Ex excellent. I wanted to uh, first get uh, a compliment out of the way. I, I, you have a, I, to, in, for my ear and for my um, limited but um, real experience as a pianist who used to accompany opera singers a lot in a former life. So, um, a special combination of um, the theatrical with a rich voice that's nimble. Uh, you know, you can really finesse passage work for the size of your voice um, in a way that I don't hear, hear often. And also, um, honestly, just... Um, I really appreciate just singers who hit the center of the pitch. You're, no, I'm just serious. I mean, I'm, I've been around a lot of singers, and you know, again, for your for your type of voice, and that's always like an obsessive 
um, neurotic venture to like talk about what is your voice type. But for my ear, again, for the voice type that I feel you are, you bring a lot to the table. And then on top of that, you have an actual interest in the literary, theatrical side to it. And so that's a lot of angles that you were that not not every singer brings all of that. So that's, you know, um, no, it's, it's great. And so my, my follow up question. Well, that wasn't even a question. My question is, I'm, yeah, um, she, she's like, just keep talking, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, OK, that's the easy part. Um, simple question. Um, is there a language that you um, prefer to sing? I would imagine maybe Spanish may be up there, but also uh, I was really impressed with your French. I'm not in any way approximating a language expert or diction expert. I don't, but I was very impressed with that. And just wondering where your heart gravitates to in terms of languages. And... Well, that's, that's a very interesting question. I don't think anyone had ever asked me that. Um, I'm, I'm a language nerd. I really, really love studying languages and everything about it, not only diction, but um, the, like the history of where words come from and how they move from one place to another, how they're connected. And, um, so I really enjoy the process of working with the poetry in whatever language it is uh, for whatever aria or whatever given piece I am about to perform. I think it is easier for me to say what languages are harder for me to sing in than one that I would gravitate towards. I do have to say I love, I love French. I absolutely adore French. And I think it has to do with very early experience as a young uh, college student at the Peabody Conservatory um, being part of Thomas Grubb's French diction class and French literature class. Um, and I, I fell in love with the repertoire. I love the, the way that he took the language apart to explain um, how to pronounce it correctly, going uh, beyond just phonetics. Um, and it just, I don't know, I, I love it. And I, I find it to be uh, a language that is easy for me to articulate in while also carrying a melody and to do it in throughout my entire range. I find English very hard, very, very hard to sing in. And I don't know if it necessarily really is or if it has like a lot of baggage of also me learning English as a young child as a second language and not liking it from the very beginning, probably because I came from such a phonetic uh, back. My first language is Spanish. It's completely phonetic and English. When you look at it, you have no concept of what it should sound like. So I had this like love hate relationship with the language and then I learned it and I speak it perfectly fine. But to this day, um, when I sing in it, and Catherine LaBeouf, who is the English diction person, like expert in the field, will tell you the same thing. The thing about English is that you have to assign, when you sing, you sing on a vowel, right? There are like consonants that divide, but the main thing is the vowel. And for a lot of English, when it's spoken, there is no true vowel. We just like swallow, there's a, this schwa amorphous thing. You can't do that if you're going to sustain a note for one second, two seconds, three seconds. So then you have to go through the painstaking process of assigning what vowel most approaches what you want <laughs> so that the word is understood. And so I have to say, that's what I could say about a language that I gravitate. But I, I love French. I love the French repertoire. And I have, as an adult, become much more fluent in German and become more in love with the German repertoire as well. Um, so I would say that I feel very at home. Um, in Spanish, I feel like because I've done less Spanish classical music, it's hard for me to remember my full classical technique while also singing in my own mother tongue that is so non-classical, so popular, so normal, you know? <laughs> so, I don't know. That may be a weird answer, but... <laughs> With the mignon, which you uh, did so beautifully, uh, that's a, a 19th century opera that has fallen out of favor for some reason, and that there's so much um, going on, and it's, it's t I've always wanted to see a full production. I wish someone would do it again. But what attracted you to that character? Because it's, it's the climax of the opera, and um, there's so much meaning that has to go into it. What, what attracted you to the aria? You know, I first heard the aria by complete mistake. I was surfing on YouTube, going from singer that I like to singer that I like and seeing what they were offering. And then all of a sudden comes, I think it was Marilyn Horn in a performance uh, on a 
at a park in New York, probably with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, one of those summer things. Very young Marilyn Horn. And I was like, whoa, what? Just, it's so simple, but it's so beautiful. And, um, and then, you know, it was in French, so I understood what was happening. And I'm like, well, this sounds very much like Kennst du das Land in German. <laughs> and then, you know, I looked it up and I, indeed, it is a French translation of, of, of this great German um, tale. Um, for me specifically, I also have never seen a full production of Mignon. And uh, I decide to sing it often and especially today. I feel like uh, COVID and the quarantine has allowed us to be able to make choices that are out of context, just because we have nothing else to do so we can do whatever we want, right? Um, and so this aria, if completely taken out of context, if not knowing what the story is about, so clearly depicts what I often feel when I am rather uh, either in New York, where I am often, or in Berlin. I lived half time in Berlin for seven years and I loved it. But, you know, you transplant a tropical girl to the far north and you have this longing for this land. And you talk about it, it's like, it's eternally summer, it's eternally spring. And there's, you know, and as a singer as well, as an opera singer, I think we, many, many of us make the choice because it's our career and it's what we do. So we don't necessarily get to live where we want to live. We get to live where the work is, um, get to, you know, and we go from place to place. We are very much like, wanderers of the earth, right? And so there is, there's something very personal, very deep about this longing to be where you are not that that aria allows me to connect with and um, in a simple way. So it just feels to me so vulnerable and so sincere, very genuine. Mm. Wonderful, mm. thank you. Um, going back a bit to what Jonathan kind of said, uh, exploring the idea about um, an, being in your mother tongue, so to speak. Uh, I want to go to that direction, but in a very cultural way. Um, I've had the good fortune in pre-COVID times to present Laura often as part of Inwood Artworks' different programs to the Filmic, the Filmic Al Fresco series and two of our many pop-up cultural arts centers that we did in the neighborhood. Um, one of those were a pop-up gallery, which highlighted uh, your Puerto Rico art song project. And that focuses on rediscovering and celebrating underperformed Puerto Rican art, literature, music, history, and very much the culture of Puerto Rico. Uh, so Laura, um, being comfortable in that being your, uh, not your, your cultural tongue, you know what I mean? Like you, where, 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 you, where it sits really nice and easy for you, um, where it's, it's that warm place. Uh, what's, what was the spark that ignited that project? You know, <clears throat> There are several things that converged um, in the spring of 2016. Um, I've, always, I've always had a love for the music of Jack Delano. Jack Delano uh, adopted Puerto Rico as his homeland, but he was actually born in Kiev. And then um, his family had to flee Europe during the war and he ended up in the United States, I, I believe actually in New York. And then he uh, got sent to Puerto Rico as part of like the Works Progress Administration or something like that as a photographer to document uh, the quality of life on the island during the depression. And he fell in love with the people of Puerto Rico, fell in love with Puerto Rico and stayed there. I had the immense uh, honor, but really it was luck to meet this man when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old I was a member of the San Juan Churros Choir that you mentioned before. And um, there was a suite that he composed for us to uh, premiere in Puerto Rico. And he was just, he was so humble. And he would come in, I don't know how many times a week when we were rehearsing to listen to what we were doing and believe it or not, ask questions of us children. Does this feel, he spoke, he spoke Spanish fluently, he spoke English fluently, he spoke uh, Russian. But he felt like, even though he had lived in Puerto Rico for over 50 years, perhaps his grasp of the language to set to music was quite, not quite the best. So he would ask, does this seem idiomatic to you? Does it feel normal to you? And, and I was exposed to this music of his, and it is so haunting. I mean, if you, if you have the chance, go wherever you can go, YouTube, and just search for Jack Delano music. The first thing that's going to come out of Jack Delano anytime that you do a search is his photography. He's famous for it. 
his music is not known that much. But if he, there's a lot of instrumental stuff, and then there are you know the vocal pieces and the choral pieces, and it's just oh this like incredible mixture of like Eastern European meets the Caribbean, and it's just glorious. So I knew at that moment, being 11 years old, I need to know more of this man, right? And then when I was in college, I met a professor from the Conservatory of Puerto Rico, and she showed me some songs that people knew in Puerto Rico, people who study voice in Puerto Rico, have access to this music that I didn't have access to in the United States. And so there were these four songs by Jack Delano, and I was like, oh my God, it is just equally as amazing as the suite that I did when I was little. I said, this has to be known. And so first I just really got into Jack Delano's music needs to be known. And then, uh, you know, I... I grew up, I became an adult, many things. I got more politically involved with the situation in Puerto Rico. I traveled the world. I realized how much, or should I say how little, like how nothing is known of Puerto Rico anywhere. And I thought this needs to be like my life mission as an artist. Like we, I grew up there. I read our literature. It is excellent literature. Why is it not translated to every language in the world? Why is our music not performed? Why, why are our Rococo artists, why is Jose Campeche? No one knows anything about Jose Campeche. You should go Google it now. <laughs> um, you know, there's just something about the colonial status and the insular status of the island where like things just stay within its perimeter. And then uh, in the spring of 2016, simply there had been a bunch of things that happened in my personal life that led to heartbreak. And I was so sad and so depressed that I thought I was on the verge of truly just stopping uh, artistic production, like just not doing anything, just sitting, eating ice cream and watching TV. So being the disciplined, crazy person that I am, I said, you need a project. And I looked online to see what I could find. And there was a competition uh, for song literature and you could, you could submit anything. And I said, okay, then I am going to record 45 minutes of Puerto Rican art song. And I set out to, um, you know, do Jack Delano, and there was not enough music. And then I went into the library in the conservatory in Puerto Rico, and I discovered Narciso Figueroa, and I discovered, you know, a whole bunch of other people. And I said, why? Why does this exist? And why? I went to the Peabody Conservatory. I went to Manhattan School of Music. I go to the New York Public Library, where they have everything in the world. None of these people have anything from these people. It is only in the library of the Conservatory of Puerto Rico and sometimes in like obscure libraries of other conservatories uh, in the US, but that you would have to know. So I thought, this is, this is it. I need to do it. It's amazing. And I, I'm so grateful, by the way, that you gave me the stage and the place to, uh, to present this music in, in New York. I, yeah. <laughs> my pleasure, Abs absolutely my pleasure. Um, if, as, if you couldn't tell, dear listener, uh, Laura is what you would call if there was, if there was a look at passion in, in the dictionary, be a picture of Laura, uh, right, 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 right next to it, and uh, and and I for one um, really love that about you because I've always admired your use of art to champion causes that make the world a better place. And uh, for instance, like another concert you did, uh, you staged a benefit concert for to provide re relief in the forms of clean water and power generators in Puerto Rico in 2017, for example. Um, you keep, keep bringing back your past, and um, I, I think it's really great that you always kind of, you're, you're very rooted in who you are uh, and how it informs you. So I want to bring up something from your past, that the, your roots in co-opera, um, a project that you and Miriam Browning Nance founded in 2006, influenced kind of the direction where you've taken the rest of your projects. Yeah. When I was still doing my master's at Manhattan School of Music, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, Miriam Browning Nance and I, uh, were still young and studying and we were, we, it came to, up to a point where we couldn't afford to go do in the summer the programs and the things that we wanted to do. So we started this project, Co-Opera, not really thinking what it was going to be. All we wanted to do was to produce a couple of operas that summer so that we and our friends who were also quote unquote stuck in the city could perform, put roles on your resume with full orchestra, do the whole thing. That grew into this incredible community. I have to say, I often see what you do with Inwood Artworks, and I'm a little bit envious because I remember what it was to be at the center of something that, uh, that was just community, you know, like making beautiful artistic things and, uh, and, and getting friends for life from that. 
Um, and I miss it, and I see that you have that with, with what you do. Um, so, you know, it was, just, it was just an opera company for, for young artists, and then when I started going, when I started living in Germany half time, I simply did not have the bandwidth to come back and produce, and I was being hired elsewhere, so I didn't need also to produce. Um, but it came very handy after Hurricane Maria that we had this small company that was already incorporated as a 501c3, and so we were able to raise money through it. So my wife, actually, I think it was, she had the, the um, bright idea to change, you know, when you're a 501c3, you, can, you are only allowed to do X, whatever your mission is. So we changed what the mission was and got it approved so that we would be now an artistic organization that would present artistic things for the purpose of raising money for humani humanitarian causes. And, um, uh, you know, Maria was a horrible thing. I don't even want to go into that. But the feeling, like, uh, realizing uh, 10, 11 years after the uh, birth of Coopera, that the community was still there, that I could call on people and be like, assemble an orchestra for free so that we could give an operatic uh, gala and raise money and take care of these things. Um, yeah, it's something wonderful. And it's, it's great to know that the opera community and the New York community kept the Puerto Rican community uh, you're going to perform two more pieces for us today. What are they? I will be singing to a zarzuela. I say zarzuela with my uh, Puerto Rican accent. I guess if you are going to be all Castilian about it, it should be zarzuela. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Zarzuela con los de Aragón, the people from Aragón. And this is a famous romanza, or romanza um, called Las Campanas del Pilar. And then after that, I will be offering uh, death dances round my bed at night from a contemporary opera called Frida, about the legendary Frida Kahlo. Once again, Laura Varela. The fourth piece I will be singing for you today is called Romanza del Pilar, from the Zarazuela Los de Aragón by Serrano. A young actress has left her hometown of Aragón, despite her mother's warnings not to leave the town because the bells of the town church would call her back to town. But she wanted to be an actress and she left. And now she comes back, the people of the small town are rebuking her and she regrets her choices because the bells call on her soul. Oh, yes. 
The final piece I will be singing for you today is from the contemporary opera Frida by Mexican-American composer Robert Xavier Rodriguez. Frida has just been through the terrible accident that changed her life, and she's experiencing her first encounters with feeling death around her, and she is choosing to paint for the first time in her life while hoping that her boyfriend, who has not come to visit, will not forget her and come back to her. from my 
me this little easel so that I can paint lying down in bed. like a magic talisman so that one day soon you come back to me that was wonderful thank you so much wow okay i had a bit of a interest some years ago in zarzuelas could you could you give a little overview of um that genre? Sure. I mean, zarzuela is a very old art form from uh, from Spain, and it's really nothing more than opereta. It's an opereta, or what the Germans call a zingspiel, which is, you know, classically composed uh, pieces that will have dialogue within them. There is spoken dialogue. And it was huge. It still is huge in Spain. There's in in Madrid, you know, in addition to El Teatro Real in Madrid, which is the main opera house, there's the Teatro de la Zarzuela. And, um, you know, always packed. It's, it's very much uh, arraigado, like rooted in the, in the Spanish culture. Is it a genre that contemporary Spanish composers are following up on still, or is it pretty much a... You know what? To tell you the truth, I am not sure that I know to give you a real answer, but I have noticed uh, in the recent, you know, in the past decade or so, every single time I see something new coming out either of El Teatro Real or El Teatro de la Zarzuela, it has been through composed operas, fully in Spanish, and they are spectacular. And I'm very excited about that, and I think that they, they take a lot from the zarzuela genre in the sense that, you know, the music is very characteristic of Spanish classical music. It's not something that you could just, it could be from anywhere. It's definitely from Spain, but it doesn't have the dialogue anymore. So I don't know if there are contemporary zarzuela writers as well, uh, but I will tell you that there's a renaissance of Spanish opera happening. Exciting. That's very cool. Yes. Um, just one quick little comment also. I just wanted, um, for me actually, as much as for the, the listeners here, could you give a, um, a little bit of a um, context for when the um, Rodriguez was composed, because that's obviously a bit more of a contemporary musical language. I just wanted to have an idea. No. I'm not sure either. Uh, most of the main zarzuelas that are in the, in the top uh, pieces that are regularly performed date from century. I meant the Rodriguez. Oh, the, 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 the Rodriguez. Frida. Yeah, sorry, yes, yes. sorry. Yeah. Frida was composed in the early 1990s. I think it was 1991. Um, if I'm not mistaken, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> and uh, so I say contemporary in the sense that it's been like with, you know, in my lifetime, there, there's so much opera being written right now that I don't, you know, it's, it's not contemporary with this current one. But, um, and even though it was written in the 90s, and I think it was actually premiered on Broadway because it's, it's, uh, it's like kind of a crossover between opera and musical theater very similar to the kind of thing uh, like Candide, for example, Bernstein's Candide. It takes legit singing, but um, it didn't really uh, have a big boom after that original premiere until recently. And then on the past 10, 15 years, it has been picking up, picking up, and it's currently being performed everywhere in the U.S. 
I have a question about the uh, zarzuela as well, um, because it's a, a genre particular to a time and place. And I can see that um, having to speak a lot of dialogue in Spanish would be prohibitive for a lot of companies in America, for example. Um, and it kind of relates back to what you said about the Puerto Rican music and literature. Why is it you know, more prevalent in uh, uh, our country, for example. So, but I, I think, do you see any movement in our new look at diversity and the need to increase our diversity uh, culturally? I mean, as people, but also in the arts, do you see any movement to bring these works more forward? You know, I think that there's a big movement in the U.S. right now trying to bring forth more uh, Spanish language art or content. Um, but that usually revolves in the U.S. specifically around Latin American um, uh, Hispanicness, for lack of a better word, because that is the vast majority of the people who are uh, from a Spanish-speaking language in this United States country are Latin American and not Spaniards. So I don't know that um, that I've seen uh, necessarily a push for zarzuela to be done, but I would I would like to say that it should it should be done. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was like when I was in college, I was um, a chorister at the Washington National Opera, and Placido Domingo um, pro uh, sang and brought together, sorry, um, a production from the Teatro Real in Madrid of Luisa Fernanda, and it was done uh, at the Kennedy Center, and it was a, a great success, and it was very, very well done, and I feel like um, there is something uh, odd in my head about the opera community thinking that it's completely normal, for example, to have productions of the Zauberflöte, and people say the dialogue in German, the Mozart's Magic Flute. Some people translate the dialogue, but there are, you know, the big opera companies do it all in German, and people say it in German. And there's like, you know, Macbeth, and she reads a letter in Italian, and no one thinks that it's weird that she is speaking in Italian. So why are these other languages something that we say, of course, an opera singer should do that, and yet Spanish is not something that you think about. And it's not any more complicated than Italian, so I think it would behoove everyone in this country to add Spanish repertoire to their regular uh, music. <laughs> well taken, thank you. In the last uh, 20 years or so, mostly because of an initiative uh, laid out by Opera America, uh, Opera in the 80s and beyond, and now they have an opera fund where they've you know, given lots of money to composers and companies to commission new works, and uh, contemporary opera has really exploded. So it's so, so great to see that you're a part of that with this uh, Frida opera. Uh, but what my question is, what's it like to play an icon Oof. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, you know, it was surreal. Um, when I did it at Long Beach Opera, uh, I think it was three years ago, uh, Frida, I mean, you say an icon, but I think that we don't really have a concept of how much an icon she is until you go to, like, the greater L.A. area, you know, because you find yourself in the heart of, like, the Mexican-American community, and she's, she's a saint. She's a, you know, so I, I literally walk down the street and people would recognize me from the posters or from they saw the show and it, it was insanity um, and I was very aware of this it was like a, a dual thing going on in my head from the point of view of like this completely wacky fame that I did not expect to have you know like and then of course it, 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 it lasted just as long as like production lasted then I, I was a nobody again <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but so I was acutely aware of that and I thought it was, you know, like this parallel reality that I was living in. And then at the same time, you know, I grew up in Puerto Rico knowing Frida Kahlo because of her work. Um, I didn't really know much of her as the woman um, until later, until I was an adult. And of course, the famous Hollywood movie came out as well. And so everyone knew about Frida. And um, what was what is most important to me was precisely not to play into... Um, the stereotypical aspects of her life that, that, that people would think, oh, you know, she's, she's, she's so strong of a woman, she's foul-mouthed, and she is, you know, uh, a, only a fashion icon, and she, um, uh, she was bisexual, and she had all of these affairs uh, with the whole, you know, 
it, it, one can be reduced to every one of these uh, qualities or these instances in life or like be, be reduced solely to uh, the person who had a trolley hit you and then you were crippled for the rest of your life. Um, but she's, she's a complex woman with complex feelings about everything. And this opera allowed you to explore that because it was it's a series of vignettes with all of the complications and relationships in her life. And so I wanted to play a real woman, a, a Frida that you may be like, wow, that was Frida? Like, yeah. <laughs> well, Laura, our listeners will want to know more about that project and all the other projects you've been a part of. Where might they be able to find more out about you and your career? Where can we send them? <laughs> well, you can go to uh, my website, definitely, at lauravirella.com. That's my name, L-A-U-R-A-V-I-R-E-L-L-A.com. Um, but of course, COVID is going on. So there's just uh, a lot of, of stuff, of content that we're all trying to put together, recording in studios. And so you release those things in your different social medias. I'm on Instagram. I have a Facebook page. You can look me up. I'm on Twitter. Um, and hopefully there will be the post-COVID times at some point, and I will have some amazing productions to, uh, to announce, and I hope that I will see all of you over there. Well, thanks again to Laura Rev for joining us here on this live and local edition of In What Artworks On Air, where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all kinds who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. If you have a moment, please show us some love right now by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. I also want to thank Ala uh, Milchstein, right, yes. uh, who brilliantly accompanied Laura today. And thanks also to our Series Atonement here for hosting us and to HeightSites.com for local uptown promotional support. Be sure to follow us on social media at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmwork Al Fresco, pop-up art galleries, live performances, and so much more. You can support On Air and all our programming by making a tax-free donation at inwoodartworks.nyc backslash donate. Inwood Artworks On Air is made possible with funding from the NYC and Company Foundation with support from Manhattan Borough President Gail A. Brewer and the Niska Electronic Media Film Grant Program in partnership with Wave Farm Media Arts Assistance Fund and the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Thank you again for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims. I'm Jonathan Bell. And Gordon Ostrowski. For Inwood Artworks On Air. <laughs>